All right, good evening and welcome now uh, to uh, the Sunday evening service here at uh, Maranatha Baptist Church. We're thankful for all those that are uh, signed in and signing in to join us here uh, for this worship time. Uh, I had a surprise when I came in here tonight and uh, here in front of me, let's see, uh, I don't know, there's uh, about 30 or 35 of you sitting here with your pictures taped to the pews. I don't know who's responsible for that, uh, but it's a blessing to see you looking at me. I We've been praying here for, for everybody to be protected uh, in this coronavirus pandemic, and apparently we need to pray more than I thought because it appears that a lot of you have developed a flat personality. <laughs> Bad joke, right? Bad joke, but uh, that's good, and uh, I appreciate that, and I'll try to keep my eye on the camera instead of the flat folk here on the front, amen? All right, let's think in this, I was thinking this evening as we get started. Uh, about Psalm 59 and verse 17. The Bible says, Unto thee, O my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. God is my defense. And that's the kind of the thought we want to go with tonight. And so thinking about him as our defense, let's sing together hymn 574. 574, hold the fort. Hold the fort. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace we will See the mighty host advancing Satan leading on Mighty men around us falling Courage almost gone Hold the fort for I am coming Jesus signal still Wait back to heaven by thy grace we will see the glorious banner waving hear the trumpet blow in our leader's name we triumph over every foe hold the fort for I am coming Jesus signal still wave the answer back to heaven by thy grace we will fierce and long battle rages but our help is near onward comes our great commander cheer my comrades cheer Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will. And we thank of the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ and his protection on our life, and we, we are grateful uh, for that tonight. Let's bow our heads for prayer. <clears throat> Father, we are thankful now for the opportunity once again, we have uh, to come before you, and that is indeed what we're doing here tonight, is to come before you, ask, Lord, for your cleansing, uh, Lord, for your forgiveness, ask, Lord, for your wisdom. We pray, Father, for the work of the Holy Spirit tonight in our hearts and lives, and we pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, uh, what we do here for your honor and glory. We ask your blessing again tonight on our church family. Pray that you would continue to bless and protect each one, meet needs, and Lord, strengthen your saints and strengthen the, the ministry, we pray, of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ through this time. We're thankful for all those who uh, help to make these services go as they do. Pray that you'll bless them tonight, bless their families. <clears throat> we ask, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified, of course, in everything, Lord, that we say and do. And we pray, Father, above all, that uh, your perfect will will be accomplished. Thank you tonight for your love to us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, again, 
uh, to worship. We pray that you'll bless us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's continue singing. We're going to 249. 249. Oh God, our help in ages past. <clears throat> oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. All right, and as we come now to, again, what would be the um, offering time of the service, we do want to say again how much we appreciate uh, the faithfulness of God's people in this time as you give your tithes and faith promise and offerings. Uh, and uh, so many have, again, sent those to the church, dropped them by the church through the week or given on the website, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, we want to continue to be found faithful by the Lord uh, in this time, as we have been mentioning that the work of the gospel uh, and the work of the Lord is still going forward here day to day, best we can, uh, at the church. And so we appreciate your prayers about that and your faithfulness toward it. Uh, do remember to pray, please, uh, for these folks that we've been keeping before you, uh, both Taylor families at this time, uh, Sister Kempton, Brother Rigney, Brother Masters, Brother Provenzano, uh, the Stanfields, Brother Stelzig, Brother Chapel, uh, Gail Weston, Linda Rankin, the Firths, we're praying for them, the Spicers, the Ennises, and the White Houses. And then this afternoon, we got uh, word from the Macias family that Nathan uh, has a fever and they would appreciate your prayers uh, for him at this time. And then also, uh, Jackie Hayes' grandfather passed away and would appreciate your prayers for that family uh, at this time as well, that the Lord will bless and help them, especially in this current circumstance. So again, we encourage you uh, to continue to be faithful in your prayers for these folks, and let's do that right now. Father, again, we're grateful for your goodness. We are thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to pray. We, we ask, Lord, your blessing on each of our church family that we've mentioned and on our church family as a whole. And we want to rejoice tonight, Lord, in, um, uh, in the willingness of your people to be used of you at such a time as this. Thank you for those, Lord, who are watching out and taking care of and uh, meeting the needs of others. We pray that you'd continue to bless that and may it continue to grow and increase in our church. And we pray, Father, again for your blessing and protection. We ask for uh, your help for Nathan tonight. We pray, Lord, that you will uh, bless uh, his health. We pray for his recovery uh, in the scope of your will. Bless the Messiahs, Lord, and uh, give them strength and wisdom as they continue to uh, work in that situation. That entire family, we pray for them. We ask your blessing on Jackie Hayes and her family uh, in the home going of her grandfather. Father, it's a blessing to know uh, that he is now with you, but we pray for peace. And Lord, we pray for your uh, strength and comfort uh, for the family. And Lord, we thank also tonight, especially of Brother Provenzano, uh, we ask, Lord, that you'll bless and help him and his family, Deanie and Rebecca, as they're not able to even visit him in the hospital. We pray, uh, Lord, for their help and strength and for Brother Provenzano's uh, recovery, if it be your will. We do pray for that. And then, Lord, we pray for others who have been struggling regularly, the Stanfields. Also, uh, we pray for Brother Stelzig. And, Lord, we, uh, we also pray uh, for Brother Mike Rigney. We pray for your help, peace, uh, Lord, strength and recovery for each of these. Thank you for your love and goodness to us, Lord. Thank you for the privilege we have uh, to be a part of your work uh, in prayer and in giving. And we're thankful, Lord, for how you're blessing as a result. We pray again that you would help us to be found faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One announcement before we continue uh, singing here tonight. 
uh, is that um, the Ladies Joy Fellowship will be live streamed this Saturday at 10 o'clock. And so we'll be sending out more information about that. Uh, but the Ladies Joy Fellowship will meet via live stream on this coming Saturday. And we appreciate your prayers for that. Thank you, Gracie. And we will continue singing here, number 20. Uh, number 20, a mighty fortress is our God. <clears throat> a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal prevailing for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal did we in our strength confide our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side the man of God's own choosing dost ask who that may be Christ Jesus it is he Lord Sabaoth his name from age to age the same and he must win the battle and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us the prince of darkness grim we tremble not for him his rage we can endure for lo his doom is sure one little word shall fail him that word above all earthly powers no thanks to them abideth the spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth let goods and kindred go this mortal life also the body they may kill god's truth abideth still his kingdom is forever 
uh, aren't you glad then uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is that defense for us and we do have a mighty fortress in the God of heaven. That's certainly comforting uh, at times like these. Let's take our Bibles then tonight and turn to 3 John. 3 John, <coughs> excuse me, and um, tonight uh, be a little bit, uh, somewhat a little bit of a different message. Uh, some thought, thoughts, excuse me, that I jotted down uh, thinking about this idea of our health. Now, don't everybody panic. Uh, obviously, I'm not a doctor, and I don't, you know, as they say, I don't play one on TV either. So, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to stay within the realm of what I know, and primarily that's going to be, obviously, then from the Scriptures. Amen. But some thoughts tonight that I hope will be an encouragement and help to us um, uh, and uh, in these days. And, um, and hopefully, hopefully they'll, uh, they'll encourage some. 3 John, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. 3 John, verse 1. The Bible says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things. This verse 2 is our key verse. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your goodness now and again for the Word of God. And I pray that you would very, simp uh, very uh, uh, simply help me uh, to uh, preach simple truths from your Word, to give strength to your people uh, as we are facing something many uh, of us have not obviously faced in our lifetime. Our country's not faced in, this, uh, in these same ways as it has in the past. And so there are a lot of questions and uncertainties and I just pray somehow or another, use these simple thoughts to be a help to your people, and uh, I'll be grateful, Lord. Uh, cleanse me of sin, fill me with your spirit, Lord, and use me, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Again, verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the events that are taking place around us and uh, the, uh, all of the talk about uh, you know, preparedness and all that other kind of thing in these last few weeks caused me to remember a time some years ago uh, when I read in the newspaper about how at that time the United States was shifting from a Cold War posture uh, to that of a preventative defense. And it seems like in light of this current pandemic, everyone is encouraged to practice preventative defense. Uh, in the maintenance world, we would often schedule preventative maintenance inspections or PMIs. Uh, and uh, just as some PMI prevents uh, major equipment failure, so some preventative defense postures help us avoid major failures in every aspect of life. An illustration of that would be Regular visits, of course, to your doctor and your dentist, and uh, as uh, they encourage those because, as has often been said, prevention is better than the cure, and an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You may have heard that before. And so we want to talk about some things with regard to our overall health. And as we think about that, some of the things I'll mention to you may seem awfully simple, but I would encourage you to remember Proverbs 22 and 3, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. In our text here in verse 2, we see two things, and that is, first of all, uh, the idea of physical health, and then we see spiritual health. Uh, spiritual health. So in verse 2 he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, 
even as thy soul prospereth. And so, talking about this matter of a preventative defense, there are certain guards we need to put in place uh, that can help us uh, endure difficulties, that can help us um, um, to be able to weather storms in a, in a much more, uh, from a position, I should say, of strength, is what I'm trying to say. And so there are three things I'd like to mention to you tonight quickly. First of all, if you're going to have a preventative defense, uh, you're going to have to, in this life I'm talking about, uh, and that certainly would include what's going on as well in our, in, in, uh, in our country at this present time, but if you're going to set up a preventative defense posture, then you're going to have to, first of all, guard your health. You're going to have to guard your health, and that's what you're doing. Many of you are doing. You're protecting yourself. We're, we're not meeting here as a church together for that very reason. We are trying to guard our health, and much more than our health, of course, those that are most vulnerable in our society. Now, when you talk about guarding your health, there's not uh, a lot of preaching done here for a couple of reasons. One would be because of conviction. And I would have to say as a preacher, when I think about my own health, you know, I, I'm tempted to say like they told the Lord, physician, heal thyself. Amen. Uh, but um, the other reason is, uh, is just uh, plain ignorance. And, but the fact of the matter is, as we look at these things, we realize that poor health is the cause of many spiritual and emotional problems. Uh, and um, uh, the Bible teaches, uh, does provide some teaching regarding health. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I'll quote some verses to you. Proverbs 14 and verse 30 says this, A sound heart is the life of the flesh. A sound heart is the life of the flesh. Uh, that means we want a sound heart. To the best of our ability, we want to have a sound heart. Now, there are spiritual uh, implications there as well, and they're connected with the physical, as, we see, as we'll see in just a moment. But, but we need a strong heart, right? And then in Acts 27 and 34, the Bible says, Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. And at that time, uh, they were in a very difficult circumstance. Paul was aboard the ship with sailors, and uh, there had been a storm. There was going to be a shipwreck. Uh, and, uh, and Paul was telling them that they needed to eat for strength. Connected with that is Ecclesiastes 10 and 17, where the Bible says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Here, here's the point of that verse. Uh, it's talking about self-control there. Uh, and it says that the land is blessed when the princes eat in due season. In other words, they eat when they're supposed to, and they eat for the right reason. They eat for strength and not for drunkenness. They eat when they're supposed to, uh, and they eat for strength, and, they, and they're not given to excess. And then also there's, of course, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of, and of that which is to come. And so that's a very familiar verse to us. Bodily exercise profiteth little. Uh, and uh, you can take two sides in approaching that. One, you can talk about how the Bible is basically saying, well, it's not enough to even worry about. Uh, on the other side, uh, you could say that uh, bodily exercise does profit some. But nonetheless, the Bible makes reference to it. Actually, the passage of Scripture there has to deal with the idea of putting uh, bodily health and strength and the attaining of that uh, up in priority to the, point, to the point of becoming an idol. And certainly that's where we would see a lot in our society. They, they live for health and strength. But of course, the spiritual thing is the most important thing, and that's the idea of the verse. But then also Paul told Timothy this in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23, "'Drink no longer water,' But use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. And, uh, you know, Paul said there, look, uh, the water could be messing your stomach up, so take wine. We believe, of course, wine, a reference to grape juice, uh, and drinking that uh, instead of drinking the water. But Paul gave him some counsel there with regard to what was causing him, uh, according to this, often infirmities. And then in uh, and then in Thess 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, 
we see very clearly uh, the point of all this, uh, that our mind and our soul and our body are connected. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we talk about man being made in the image of God, body, soul, and spirit, and they are all connected in a miraculous way uh, so that even illness in one can adversely affect the other. And so we have to be careful with regard to our health. Bible talks about it, mentions it here and there. It certainly tells us not to make our body a, an idol in any way or that type of thing, uh, but it does uh, teach us some things about this matter. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when we're talking about this matter of health and uh, what the Bible says about it, we ask the question, why uh, do we need to take care of it? Well, if you look over with me at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, uh, and beginning in verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and uh, verse 19. Uh, many of you have already know and aware of the, uh, many of the reports and studies on the connection uh, with health uh, and mental and emotional well-being. Uh, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so very simply, the Bible says here that our body is God's temple, uh, and our body is our strength for God's service, and we are told here that in, to some degree, uh, our body is a part of our stewardship before God. And so there needs to be some consideration uh, to that. Now, how in the world, then, if there is the, the, again, very basic, simple truth from the Bible, but how then do I help to take care of those kind of things? Well, the first thing, of course, would be uh, in taking care of my body to avoid poor habits. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. And we apply that to a lot of things, but it might be good for us to apply to our, what we take into our body as well. Amen. And I'm telling you, I'm preaching to me like I'm preaching to you. Uh, but uh, for instance, we would want to avoid drinking alcohol. It's been known for years. It kills brain cells. Uh, and the Bible talks about how that's biblically proven. If you go to Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, and uh, we see the end result of that. Proverbs, and again, this is not a message on drunkenness, um, but uh, Proverbs 23 and down in verse 29, and the Bible gives warning about that. Proverbs 23 and uh, here in verse number 29, the Bible says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup, that's talking, when it moveth itself aright, that's talking about the fermentation process. At the last it biteth like a serpent. Now if we just pay attention to that, it teaches stay away from it altogether. At the end it bites like a serpent, stings like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. What kind of silliness is that? Or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And that there talks about, very clearly it talks about the addictive nature uh, of alcohol. Uh, and the idea of laying down in the sea or laying down on top of a mast indicates very clearly you drink too much of that stuff and your thinking goes wrong. I mean, you have no control over yourself. Another thing, for instance, would be the idea of smoking. Uh, and uh, some people say, well, Charles Spurgeon smoked. Well, yes, yes, he did. Uh, but that was long before the, health of, the bad health effects were known. And by the way, um, when, uh, when a particular, as I understand it, when a particular tobacco company uh, had, uh, had talked with Charles Spurgeon, uh, about uh, wanting to use his image on their cigar 
uh, advertisements, he quit. He said, I don't want to be known for cigar smoking. I want to be known for preaching the gospel. Amen, amen. And so uh, then also the idea of chewing tobacco and all that kind of thing uh, and the mouth cancer and all that. You see the commercials, don't you? I mean, I've, I've told you before. When I was a kid, I remember those uh, 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 commercials on TV. You know, this is your brain and they had an egg and this is your brain on drugs and they smashed the egg. And I just believed that was going to happen if I did drugs, so I didn't do it. In fact, the matter is it does smash your brain. Uh, speaking of doing drugs, uh, you know, that's uh, forbidden in the scripture. It's not good for you. It dishonors God and it can set you up for trouble. Look at Galatians chapter number five. Galatians five. And by the way, <clears throat> there are a number of people that had been involved in the drug scene for years and years before they got saved that would tell you in a minute, I wish I'd never touched the stuff. I wish I'd never done it. Galatians chapter number five and verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Uh, and so he mentions here uh, this matter of um, uh, verse, uh, verse, verse 20, idolatry and witchcraft. That word witchcraft translates a Greek word uh, from which we get our word pharmacy, and it has to do uh, with the drug-induced uh, uh, trances that people would get into when they, worship, when they worshiped false gods. It's connected with that. The Bible says we ought not do it. Uh, and uh, uh, very clear. So we need to avoid poor habits. Uh, that includes this matter of illicit uh, type addictions. It also includes the matter of, uh, uh, you know, our eating habits and all that other kind of thing, which leads me to this next point that we need to be careful about what we're eating. You know, somebody said you are what you eat and uh, poor, poor eating in your youth affects your later health. I mean, there are people that would tell you, especially if there's any young people listening tonight, listen here, there are people that'll tell you, I wish I'd paid attention to, to my eating habits when I was younger because now my health is adversely affected because of my lack of discipline in early years. The Bible deals with the matter of gluttony. Matter of fact, Proverbs 23 and verse 21, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. The drunkard and the glutton shall come to power. Now, glutton, many people think about gluttony as uh, just eating and eating and eating. And that's true. That's what it is. But really, uh, uh, many times it has the idea of purging. And so you eat and purge so you can eat again. And then you eat and purge so you can eat again. So what is it? It is an addiction uh, to uh, the uh, chemicals that are released in our uh, body when we eat. Really what it is, it is turning food into an idol. It is a form of of idolatry. And so the Bible then not only deals with gluttony, but as I said before, it deals with the matter of a lack of self-control. Here in Galatians chapter number five and verse uh, 22, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, verse 23, meekness, temperance. And that word temperance has to do, that word temperance has to do with self-control. Self-control. Now, no, no. Uh, the believer, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, ought to be able to, to work toward victory in these areas. And they're, you know, obviously, look, I'm not a doctor. I'm trying not to get into that. I'm just trying to help you see what the Bible says about uh, some things. And, and sometimes there can be some chemical imbalances and all that thyroid issues and problems. I mean, all kinds of things. Uh, but, but generally speaking, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life is supposed to teach us temperance, which is self-control. And, and so it's very difficult for us to say that I have the Holy Spirit in me, therefore I'm going to live a temperate life when it comes to adultery and all that, but I'm not going to worry too much about food. No, no, temperance applies to the entire life as a whole. And so we've been taught for years, you know, to eat healthy and avoid junk food and sugar and all that other kind of thing. And, and you know, look, we're not the first ones to go through. Solomon told us clearly there's nothing new under the sun. Listen to what Spurgeon said about this. He said, most of us are unsound physically. And he was one of them. I mean, have you ever seen pictures of him? He was quite the rotund fella. All right. So he, so he was one of them, but, but he knew it. And he said, most of us. 
He didn't say most of y'all. He said most of us are unsound physically. Certain bodily maladies, especially those connected with the digestive organs, are the fruitful fountains of despondency. Wow. So you see there how even all those years ago, uh, it was connected, our, our, our physical and emotional health connected with our spiritual well-being because of that. Well, I need to watch them. I need to pay attention. Uh, and I, I read, again, let me just say this. I don't want to get hung up on this because definitely my last, two name, my, last two, my last name is not spelled with two letters, O-Z. So I'm not Dr. Oz, all right? Uh, but I will tell you this, the Bible's got something to say about it. And again, we said earlier that it talks about us eating for strength and not for drunkenness. So we need to develop discipline in that area as well. So watch what he said. Uh, thirdly, get uh, regular exercise. And I know this is crazy and somebody's going to get upset. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, look, in biblical times, the, the, really people were a lot more active than we are now. Our society has changed dramatically. Matter of fact, if you, if you read some of the studies and, and all that that go on, you find out that, that, a, whole lot of, that a whole lot of our a workforce is a sedentary workforce, which means we have to make diligent effort to move the body. God intended for our body to move. And so, again, listen to some preachers of old that said some things about this, just things I found interesting. If you're not interested, then grab a cup of coffee and come back in a minute. Uh, but the Bible, say, uh, the Bible says, Dr. Criswell said uh, one time, he said, uh, exercise every day, not just once in a while or once a week. Follow a routine pattern every day. If you do not have time to exercise, neither do you have time for anything else, jogging, walking, playing a game, he said, just do it. Then Spurgeon again said this, there can be little doubt that sedentary habits have a tendency to create despondency in some constitutions. And quoting from, a, a, from Bert, a Burton, a book uh, uh, entitled Anatomy and Melancholy, he said, students are negligent of their bodies. Other men look to their tools. A painter will wash his brushes and a smith his hammer. The husband, husbandmen will uh, take care of his plow and the musicians will take care of their instruments. Uh, and so he said to sit long in one posture, poring over a book or driving a quill, which not many people drive a quill anymore, but driving a quill is in itself taxing of nature. But add to this a badly ventilated room and a, a body which has long been without exercise and a heart burdened with many cares and we have all the elements for preparing a seething cauldron of despair. Wow. Spurgeon wrote that. And then he said this, let a man be naturally light hearted as a bird. He'll hardly be able to bear up year after year against such, against such a suicidal process. He'll make his study a prison and his books the warders while nature lies outside his window calling him to health and joy. Getting out and doing some activity is the best medicine for hypochondriacs, he said. Uh, and then uh, the surest tonic for the declining and the best refreshment for the weary for lack of opportunity or inclination. These great remedies are neglected and the student becomes a self-emulated victim. Wow. Wow. Then T. Uh, T. DeWitt Talmadge said this. He was a, a great preacher in Brooklyn, a pastor and preacher. Uh, and uh, he, he listen, some of y'all going to like this. He gave a cure for irate preachers. Are you ready? And by the way, this is some of the reason for uh, my reading these things is because of the job that I do. Uh, but I know many of you uh, wrestle with these kind of things as well. But anyway, he gave a, a cure for irate preachers. He said, in order to avoid this, keep your digestion good. You want not only a sanctified heart, but a sound liver, he said. Eat no lobster salad Saturday night. Take gymnastics, split wood, ride a horse, row a boat, keep the pores open with a cold water and a bath and a coarse towel. Listen to this. He said, it's a shame for a minister to wash only his fingers and the tip of his nose. That's gross, isn't it? That's right. But he said, keep yourself clean, get good, sound, robust health, and it will be almost impossible for you to scold. Commenting on that, Chriswell said, a schedule of Vigorous rail-splitting exercise ought to cure any man's predisposition to be despondent, dejected, and depressed. And so, uh, you know, move the body God gave you uh, at a regular interval, uh, and it will help. Fourthly, I'm moving on. I've got other things I want to say. Get, we need to, God design our bodies uh, to, uh, to get proper rest, to have the need, I should say, for proper rest. In Mark 6 and 31, the Bible says, He said unto them, 
Come ye, Jesus said, come ye yourselves apart in a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Now, the Bible warns against resting all the time. Amen. It talks about the sluggard turning over on his bed like, uh, like a door turning on, on its hinges and talks about how that poverty will come as a result of that. So we're not talking about laying around all the time, but we're talking about getting necessary rest as the Savior even noticed in, as a need for his disciples. I remember Pastor Harold saying, some have the notion that since the devil never rests, neither should they. But we don't get our instructions from the devil. Jesus said, come apart and rest a while. And so we need to exercise, we need to eat, we need to rest. And the first two help the third. You, you look, you're not able to stay up at night with the owls and fly in the morning with the eagles. And so many times, those difficulties and problems that we blame on the devil may be, may be more rightly blamed on poor habits. And it's not taking care of our, in not taking care of our temple, we not only sin against God and rob Him, but we sin against and rob ourselves of life's fullness and joy. So, uh, just some simple thoughts there on guarding your physical health. We do have a responsibility to some degree to do that. Secondly, if we're talking about setting up a preventative defense, we need to not only guard our physical health, but we need to guard our mental and emotional health as well. Now, uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. And here's what it says, 2 Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, thought to the obedience of Christ. And so he's talking here about guarding our mind. Uh, the Bible says in Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Proverbs 23, 7, As he thinketh, thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4 and 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Psalm 101 and verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Now I know that's talking about idolatry, uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to keep mindful about what we allow to influence us in our mind and our thinking. Look, the devil wages a mental battle and wrong thinking leads to wrong living and that's why the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter number four to think on these things. Good things, wholesome things, pure things, right things. We, and look, we choose what we think on. And so be on guard. Wake up. Take a defensive posture. Be uh, in a preventative defensive, defense posture with your mind. Be on guard against things like destructive programming in your life. Garbage in, garbage out. You know, what you take in on the TV, what you take in on the internet, all of that kind of thing, what you take in reading, what you take in listening on the radio. Uh, you got to be careful about that, which could uh, uh, be responsible for interjecting destructive thought patterns into your thinking. Read good books. Read good books. And make not provision for the flesh. Be on guard against destructive programming. Be on, we're talking about protecting our mind and emotion. Be on guard against discouragement. Now we've preached on this already, but Isaiah 41 and 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God's talking about how that he will uphold us. He is with us, uh, and we are to take encouragement from that. Discouragement is the devil's tool to shut us down. And the way we get discouraged is by spending too much time looking inward and outward, but not upward toward God in our focus. Discouragement says God has forgotten me, but in reality we have forgotten God, and, uh, and we have forgotten His scriptural uh, encouragement, all things work together for His good. If you'll keep your mind and eyes on God, you can find encouragement even in the most discouraging circumstances, and we see that with David when he encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, it's the hardest thing in the world to do when you're discouraged because our mind gets kind of like a, well, it gets like a toilet when you flush it. 
And once you start that process, it just spirals down. And unless something stops that, that's going all the way to the sewer. You understand? And so it is with our thinking. We have to, we have to make a willful choice to think as the Bible's told us to think. Think about God. Think about His righteousness. Think about His goodness and His mercy. And, uh, and think about all, uh, that the Bible teaches us about the sound mind. So avoid. And look, why are we preaching this? Because many people are sitting at home all day. And, they're already worried about not just the pandemic, but they're worried about the effects of that after this is over, what kind of damage is going to have been done in people's heart and mind and body while they've been sitting around for months on end. You've got to think about it. And the Bible says then uh, that we need to be careful about what, to, what, what, uh, what we allow into our mind. Avoid destructive programming. Avoid discouragement. Avoid despair. Uh, and uh, discouragement, as we said before, says God has forgotten me. Despair says God is dead. But the fact of the matter is God's never going to die. And so as long as God's alive, there's hope. Uh, but discouragement leads to despair. That's what Paul was talking about. Matter of fact, uh, we're in 2 Corinthians. Look at chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And we look down here at uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter number 1 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians 1 and 8, here's what Paul said, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. We had the sentence of death, and we despaired there, he said, even of life. You got to watch it. Watch despair. That's the lie of the devil to you. The, the Bible says the devil's a liar and the father of it. And, and every time he lies to you, you just uh, remember 1 Peter 5 and 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And so watch that discouragement. Watch that despair. Watch against, uh, guard against destructive programming. And then guard against depression. Now go back over with me to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. Now as far as this... Uh, stay-at-home order is concerned, there is room for us to be able uh, to at least get out and around our house, uh, go to the store, whatever. It's all there. You know about it. Uh, but 1 Kings 19, uh, and we, we see the story of Elijah uh, when Jezebel's trying to hunt him down. Uh, and uh, you read the story about, uh, about how that he uh, he, he ran from God and uh, ran from Jezebel and uh, ended up on Mount Baal. And, uh, and, and he said, uh, he asked the Lord to kill him. He asked the Lord, just take him out of this life. Uh, and so I want you to notice several things about this matter. First of all, notice the who of it, and that is Elijah. Now we're talking about a prophet here. And what that means, and a great prophet, one used greatly of God. And so that means that anyone is, is uh, susceptible to, uh, to this matter of depression. Uh, and uh, we're not immune to it. We've got to be on guard against it. Why did it happen? How can it happen? Well, in Elijah's case, there was the prolonged emotional stress of hiding himself away for three and a half years. I mean, he was on the run. Ahab and Jezebel out to get him, and it caused a great deal of emotional stress. Then there was that extreme emotional stress uh, of the co a confrontation with the prophets of Baal. You know, where they had the competition between them as to which one was the real God. Uh, and uh, they cried to Baal and Elijah called to God. And God, thank God he answered that prayer and burned that whole kid and caboodle up. But uh, that, that was emotional stress, which causes emotional fatigue. And uh, you know, you, sometimes they say that the lowest valleys are the ones you experience right after the highest peaks. You have joy and then you enter into some type of sorrow. Also, though, uh, depression can, get, can be caused by disappointment in life. Life ain't coming out like I want it. Hey, you reckon Elijah said, boy, I'm so glad. I am so glad that Ahab and Jezebel trying to kill me. No, no, no. That wasn't what he was saying at all. No doubt he was disappointed by that. And then, uh, you know, he said to himself uh, uh, when he was there, he said, uh, they've killed all the prophets and I alone, he said. I alone. He alone, he said, serve. That's the way he got I'm the only one. No, no, you're not the only one. And we read as we read 1 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, 1 Kings 19, 
that he had physical fatigue and physical weakness. He hadn't eaten. And so one of the first things that God did with him uh, was to take care of that. On top of all that was the obvious satanic opposition against the work of God. So there were a lot of factors working in the life of Elijah that brought him to this point uh, of depression where he wanted God to take his life. How did God deal with it? That's what I want to get to. First thing you got to do is recognize God as part of the solution. Amen. The same God that saved you is the same God that will strengthen you. And so uh, he went to Mount Baal. That's the Mount of God. And then, uh, so, what, so what am I saying here? You've got to think on God. It gets right back to the same things. Turn your attention to God and talk to God. Uh, and then you've got to deal with physical and uh, fatigue factors. Look at verse 5 of 1 Kings 19. Um, uh, he said, well, let's go to verse 4 again. That tells us where he was. And he said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life. That's the last part of verse 4. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, get up and read your Bible. Is that what that said? That's not what it said. What does it say? It's just that simple. Arise and what? Eat. Eat. Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. I mean, he got up and ate something. He drank something, and he went back to sleep. What are we talking about here? Again, we're talking about dealing with the physical and the fatigue factors of your life. And then the second thing you need to do is seek some spiritual counsel. Look at verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, look, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now watch. Wow, I don't have a lot of time here, so I want to be careful about how deep I go. But what you will notice here is that God did not allow Elijah to continue in the mindset of victimhood. God forced Elijah to think about the false thinking that led him to the place where he was. What are you doing here, Elijah? Why? Uh, are, why are you in the condition you're in? Verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, uh, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Now watch what God does. Basically, uh, the Lord told Elijah, look here, you need to get your thinking straight. He's getting, he's, and now in this case, he's getting spiritual counsel from God, and God is going to be faithful to give us what we need, not what we want. You know what most people want? People to have a continual pity party about their life and the problems they got. God wasn't allowing that with Elijah, because he knew if he let Elijah wallow in that, he'd never uh, recover from his uh, despondency. And so he begins to counsel him, and behold, the Lord passed by, a great and strong wind rent the mountains, verse 11, break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind, after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, after the fire a still, small voice. And so it was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? There's the question again. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he says, verse 15, the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king of Syria, uh, 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 to be king over Syria. Now watch what God's doing. God said basically this, Elijah, stop feeling sorry for yourself and get back to the work I called you to do. He didn't even give him, he didn't even give him no chance to argue no more. And look, that's what we need. Somebody, and, and what, so what's going on here? God's word was what Elijah needed to hear and it's how Elijah needed to think. Elijah did not need to continue to think uh, in the fashion that he had that was carnal and self-focused and not on God. And I'm telling you, brother, uh, you and I, if we're going to take encouragement in this life, we'll have to get it from God's word. And so... 
He told him, verse 16, Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abimelech, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Now watch verse 18. Yet I have, I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Now watch, what did Elijah say? I'm the only one left. You know, a lot of, but God said, I've got 7,000 still. Now look, here's the point of all this. Many times, because depression is focused on self, we don't think according to truth. We think according to our perception, not according to truth. And that's what happened to Elijah. Can you imagine? I, I, I can only think that it must have been a shocker to Elijah, first of all, to realize he wasn't the only one. And then uh, at the same time to be an encouragement to say, wow, there are others that are sticking with it. There are others that are going through this, which is what the Bible tells us. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And so be very careful about the victim mentality. Basically, Elijah was saying, I'm doing all this stuff, God, and it's like you're not even involved, and now they're all dead, and they're going to get me too. See? He was completely focused on himself, so... You've got to take godly counsel. Godly counsel. Any kind of counsel that encourages you to continue to waller in your depression is not godly counsel. Uh, yes, you have to think, you have to get your thinking straight, and that's what God was trying to do with Elijah. Now, connected in this instance with seeking spiritual counsel was this point that Elijah spent some time with God. He spent time with God. And when you spend time with God, what does that mean? That means obviously reading the Bible. That means obviously praying. That means worshiping or whatever. But you spend time with God and God is going to be very careful by his word and by his spirit to correct your thinking in the way in which he has instructed us to think. Which will help us come up out of the toilet bowl of depression. Now watch. Here's another point, and that is, I've alluded to it already, but God told Elijah, get busy about the work I've given you to do. In other words, here's what self-pity does. It looks inward and, oh, and woe is me, and it halts us where we are. We just sit in simmer and simmer in sorrow. Now look, everybody's faced it. This preacher's faced it. And the fact of the matter is, whenever we turn inward in our thinking, uh, talking about all the problems and difficulties and struggles we have, instead of staying focused on God and focused on His call for our life, this, this thing shuts you down. It shuts you down. But God told Elijah to get busy doing what He'd called him to do and carrying out the work of God uh, and ministering there to others. And, and, and doing God's purpose for his life. Remembering the whole time, verse 18, that, uh, uh, that you are not alone. You're not the only one. That's what the devil wants you to believe. God's not being fair to you. The world is not fair to you. Well, certainly the world's not fair. Life's not fair. But God is always just. But he reminds Elijah... Here he said, wait a minute, hold on. I want you to, I want you to go find uh, Elisha. And uh, he's going to be your protege for a while because you need to get him ready to take over for your slot. Uh, and, of course, you know Elijah. God caught him up in a chariot fire, and Elisha was left. So here's what I'm talking about. Uh, look, he put Elijah back to work doing the thing he's supposed to be doing, and then he had the companionship of Elisha. And here's what I'm trying to say, and then I'm going to press on and finish my final point. And that is this. You need the fellowship of godly people in a time of depression. You need it. And, and, and people need to be an encouragement and a strength to others and, and a help to them in a time of depression. Uh, and so, but here's what happens. What, what's going to happen? Self-centeredness is going to turn us to isolation because we want to wallow in it and we don't want anybody to tell us we should be thinking differently. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is that approach that approach will only lead to further despondency and further and deeper depression. You need the fellowship of God's people. 
Amen. That's what he did. He said, I got somebody that's going to serve alongside of you. And then there's the 7,000, of course. You know, I thought about that. Uh, you're not alone. And I thought about one of the catchphrases of this pandemic. It says, alone together. <laughs> and uh, we're all locked up in home alone, but we're all together in it. And that's the way it is in the work of the Lord. You're not on your own. Take courage in that. Others are facing it as well. Matter of fact, let me say this, and then I'm going to preach this final point quickly and be done. And that is this. The Bible says that God comforts us so that we can comfort others. Now, he says comfort, not commiserate. Amen. <laughs> comfort, not commiserate. And so there needs to be uh, this comforting. As God helps you, he uses you to help others. And the Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. That's why you need the fellowship of the saints. All right, then. Guard your physical health. Guard your mental, emotional health. And then uh, guard your spiritual health. Health. Guard your spiritual health. And again, uh, I bring this one last because it's the primary thing. Guard your spiritual health. Now, how do I do that? Well, the Bible says as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Amen. Amen. I mean, make the Bible the book of your life. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on while we're sitting at home. And, uh, and look here, we're not telling you to push everything aside and grab you a little table and a candle and read your Bible for 180 days and don't do nothing else. That's not what we're talking about. But there ought to be plenty of time for you to spend time in God's word uh, and to read and to study and meditate on it. That'll help you. Guard your spiritual health. Reading about, uh, you know, nobody rightly thinking got their heart and mind hurt by the Bible. Nobody. They all help. Stay in the book. Stay in the book uh, during this time. Secondly, stay on your knees. Pray without ceasing. Stay on your knees during this time. Uh, you, people are facing boredom and cabin fever and all. Hey, uh, pray. Uh, and we ought to be praying. Uh, and to talking to God about this situation. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, what good's prayer going to do? Some people say, well, that indicates a problem in and of itself. Huh? Prayer, we talked about recently, I can't even remember when, but prayer is uh, one of the uh, uh, sources of power for us in enduring difficult times. That's what Jesus did. He prayed in his sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. See? Prayer and talking to God. By the way, there may be nothing to help your prayer life be more meaningful than what's going on right now. Jesus was praying in a time of high stress and difficulty and burden. Uh, he was praying out of a sense of urgency. And sometimes that's what we need is something urgent going on in our life to help our prayer life be what it ought to be. So stay in the Bible. Stay on your knees and then stay in church digitally right now. You, hey, can you imagine... Uh, here's the thing, I, I wonder, because all I'm looking at is that one camera, and I've, I've, I've dubbed it the Cyclops, all right? That's what I've called it. Uh, it's just got one eye. It don't blink. It don't smile. It don't look mean at me. It's just there. Cold as ice is that camera. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, um, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, I don't know what's going on already, but I do know this. There is going to be a temptation while you're at home having to watch these services online. There's going to be a, all kinds of temptation to skip it, to catch up later. I can hear people say, well, I'm not going to watch it tonight. My favorite show's on. I'll catch up. And before you know it, you done missed four or five services on here. Now, that's no way. That'll be no way uh, to keep your, uh, to guard your spiritual health. Uh, and, uh, uh, and take the thing seriously. I was thinking about this uh, this afternoon as I was thinking about this thing. And here you are on live stream and what are you going to do? My suggestion would be to you, uh, to whatever you on your computer or on your phone or on your tablet. Some of you have it on your TV. I don't know how you got it. But you ought to treat this hour just like church hour if you were coming here. Right. And you sit down and you pay attention and you remove the distractions from around you. See, the thing is, when nobody's watching you but you, you're going to be tempted to drift out and not pay attention. It's going to take spiritual discipline. But you can do it. You, there are lots of people doing it already. Uh, but you got to do it. Because the longer we have to do this, the more the devil's going to try to get in there, listen to me, and try to break you from church. Because if he can do that, he can start you down the downward spiral. Stay in church. Stay focused on God. Pay attention to what's happening. 
And then number four, find a way to help and minister to others. Find a way to help and minister to others. You can do it with your family. Uh, you can do it maybe uh, by being an encouragement over the Facebook. Many are doing that or uh, something or another. Uh, but find a way to stay useful in the ministry for Christ to the best of your ability. Some of you are still going to work every day. And your work, your shop and all tore up all the pieces. Try to find some way to be an encouragement and a representative for the great God of heaven that'll help keep you encouraged and guard your spiritual health. We said earlier that physical inactivity leads to physical illness and spiritual inactivity will do the same. It'll lead to spiritual illness. Uh, find ways in which you can serve the Lord even in the situation uh, that, we're, that, that we're in. You need to be involved in the work of the Lord. That's what God told Elijah. Now, he said, go do this, take care of it. And so look, <laughs> some of you might feel like I jumped out of bounds tonight in some ways, and I didn't mean to. I just, I just meant to give some simple truths that came to my mind when I thought about this matter of guarding the entirety of my health. That's much more than, I've talked to my wife about these things uh, and how I need to do better. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm going to try to do better. Uh, but, uh, the, but you think about what's going on and, and you begin to realize, hey, wait a minute. My health includes so much more than just my exercise and eating. It includes my spiritual life. And what am I doing? What am I doing with my spirit? How am I strengthening myself spiritually? Uh, these things we've mentioned will require continual maintenance and checkup and repair. But if you'll guard your physical health and your mental health and your spiritual health and you keep, a, keep them in a checkup all the time, uh, you can walk in victory and will find yourself less often taken out of the battle by minor spiritual illnesses, especially at a time like this. And some of you may need to do these things. And because you're not, you're kind of faltering and you're failing and you're falling. But remember, remember, let's go back to our text. Let's go back to our text in, in, in 2 John. In verse 2, here's God's heart. This is God's heart for us as His children. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul... He connects them, your health and your soul's health. And He says here that He wants our soul to prosper. He wants our soul to prosper. And so we can maybe look at these things and scoff at them, but remember, remember the verse we quoted to you earlier, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself but the simple pass on and are punished. And we don't want that for you. We don't want that for you. Look, it's tough. It's hard. What's, what we're going through is, is, is unusual. Um, and so we're going to have to put some extra effort into maintaining ourselves as an entire being, body, soul, and spirit, if we're going to stay strong and then come out of this thing ready, ready to do something for God uh, when He allows us to do so. And when he allows us to come back together as a church and he allows our ministries to kind of get back to uh, where they were before functioning and active, we've got to stay ready. We've got to stay ready. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to look into your word. Again, simple rubber meets the road life things tonight. Help us to take them seriously. Help us to meditate on them. Lord, help us to change our ways. It's not enough to be stirred. We've got to be changed. And so help us, Lord, to change for your glory, and for the accomplishment of your will in our life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As the piano begins to play tonight, uh, maybe the Lord spoke to your heart about some one of these things or another, and I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to pray about it. Lay it out there before God, just like when Elijah was up there in that cave uh, talking to God, uh, and God asked him, said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah talked back to him, not in a bad way, but he answered his question. He said, Lord, this is what's going on, and, and i got to set this right. I encourage you, talk with God, talk with God. And God, through His Word and by His Spirit, will help get you on the right path. If you'll let Him, if you'll let Him, by the encouragement of the brethren, all that, God will use it all to help you be what you need to be.
All right, again, and thank you for being with us tonight. We, we're praying for you. Uh, and again, we want to remind you to let us know if we can help you in any way uh, uh, to strengthen you and maybe meet needs you might have or needs you know of, that others have. Um, and we miss seeing you. We pray for you every day. Uh, and uh, we look forward to the time we can gather again. We will meet uh, Wednesday night, Lord willing, uh, 7 o'clock is our prayer meeting time on Wednesday right here on the live stream. And please try to remember if you can, get your prayer requests in by 6.30 on Wednesday night so we have time to gather all those and put them together for the service. Uh, let's pray together. Again, Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Bless again these truths to our heart. Bless our church family. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that's with us tonight. And I, I pray, Father, for their encouragement, for their strength, for their health needs, for those that are helping them. I pray for all of it. God, I pray for your protection, for you to meet needs. Thank you for your goodness. And help us, Lord, to look to you. Help us, Father, to take this time to ponder our spiritual situation and allow you to strengthen it even, uh, even when we're, when we're kind of shut down on our activities, especially as we're shut down on activities. God, help us. Strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and good night to you.